G'day everybody and we're back talking about The Mandalorian. The third episode is very exciting stuff. All sorts of things are going on. Mandalorians are popping up. The child is starting to speak. Oh, golly, golly, golly. In the episode, The Heiress. Oh, it's very exciting stuff. So it's Dags and MPS with you today having a bit of a chat about all things Star Wars and a bit of Mando action. How very, very cool. MPS, what did you think of The Heiress? I thought it was pretty good and my favourite line which i had in my head which wasn't there was why would you take a frog to a fish market but anyway let's <laughs> let's get on to some of the, the more exciting bits yeah <laughs> because you yeah, see so the two frogs walking down the thing and all the quarren and that are looking at it and the monkels go hey lunch <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just weird it's a very good point actually um, i did love the the yeah. cg planets at the start you know the the, the animation is just outstanding yes, you know you can't it just looks how it should. It's perfect. It's, it's not overdone. It's not underdone. It doesn't look fake or anything like that. And when he flies over the planet, uh, yeah, it was just spectacular to look at. Yeah, clearly the Mandalorian is a show that they could not have made 20 years ago or whatever else and kept that real quality. And there's, there's one of the things you cannot fault about the program is this look and its field and its world building. It's really, really top notch. And uh, the visual effects and, uh, in fact, it just... Uh, outstanding there like cinematic quality and i totally agree with you on that mm. one too so and i loved it at the start uh when the ship crashed the razor ship razor crest crashed and i thought okay i didn't see that one coming i thought shit is everybody going to drown on board and what's going to happen now and the crane comes along with the at at legs i don't know if you noticed that or not yeah. um and puts it back on the dock and i thought yeah that was actually really really cool so uh very yeah, very that- but the thing I found interesting is that this is obviously the part three of the three part story right where the passenger being last week you could potentially argue that if the passenger last week is episode didn't happen and they, they just flew the frog from Tatooine to Trask and just continued on, you know, it would have meant you have one full episode to do some really, really cool stuff like this episode. So there is a school of thought saying that last week really wasn't necessary at all because you didn't achieve anything. So, but you know, it is what it is. And it, uh, you sort of move on from there. Yeah. I did. I did like the fact that as the, the razor crest has fallen down through the atmosphere, it kind of gave me a, a Firefly or Serenity mm, feel. Yeah. Like I'm sure they did that in, in one of the episodes or the movie. Uh, and it was like, yeah, you're kind of doing the same sort of thing there, guys. It was... Um... Yeah. So I guess cutting through all the mustard, there's three key things that occur in this particular show that is uh, really worth focusing on. One is the whole thing of the quarren on the barge on the water trying to steal the Mandalorian's, um, I'm going to say, Din's armor, the best car. So they're not interested in the kid. For the first time, the kid is not the focal point. His armor is the focal point. And I actually thought that was a really good scene. They opened up the thing in the, in the mesh. They chuck the kid over the side and then they start wanting to get his armor. And of course, he jumps in after the kid. Oh, I actually thought that was really well done. That really pushed my buttons. Um, the second part is obviously the introduction of the extra Mandalorians. And we'll get to that in a moment. And of course, how the Empire was treated. But uh, so getting back to the first part. So the bit on the boat, what do you think of that, man? Well, I thought it's it sort of, and this is the thing with the Mando, unfortunately, mm. they're there's too many you can see it sort of coming yeah you know it was like on the boat you didn't you need to go somewhere just take a freaking ship don't take a boat across the water you didn't need that um the other thing i didn't understand was how big is that boat underneath and how big is that creature if it you know you don't see it and then all of a sudden it comes up from underneath um the fact that he 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 gets into the water but can't hold his breath for too long and now Mm. you would think that he's not swimming that easily because Mm. armor's heavy he would have sunk and there, there should have been something underneath. Uh, but he seemed to be struggling in the water. So um, the only thing I, I really loved about that scene was the music, the Mandalorian's mm. theme music behind On the Boat. That was just picturesque. Mm. Yeah, no, you're right. There's some really, really good stuff there. Uh, I actually thought, oh, look, I, I didn't see that scene coming at all. I, it didn't, it, I mean, it just didn't twig that something was going to happen. Uh, I thought at the very least the kid's going to fall in by accident, but not to have be pushed in and then put the grill across and then fight the din for his arm. I, I thought it was just really well done uh, and something that really caught me off guard. And, of course, that then leads into the introduction of Bo-Katan and her brood. And for Star Wars fans... <clears throat> 
especially fans who know their Clone Wars and their Rebels are like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But I'm sure for everybody else is like, yeah, okay, who are these guys? <laughs> so that's the issue. But the fact that she uh, took the helmet off, I'm kind of glad she did because a lot of people knew that Katie Sackhoff was going to be playing Bo-Katan. And I thought if she keeps her helmet on the whole time, it's just like case of the Captain Phasmas, you know, it's like, well, it could anybody could have played the character. It didn't have to be Gwendolyn Christie. So, but she did take the helmet off. And I thought that was actually kind of cool because we've discussed in this show and other shows about how, you know, this is the way the helmet stays on and go, well, actually, that's not true because we've got all this evidence from all these other TV shows that have been pre produced previously, but they do take the helmets off. And I was kind of glad that they did that. That was actually very cool. And she looked spot on to the animated character, which is uh, very, very groovy. What do you reckon? It's weird seeing Katie Sackhoff with anything but blonde hair. You know, the fact that she had red hair sort of was like, hang on, I couldn't recognise her to start off with, but then I started hearing her voice uh, and that was a good thing. Um, the fact that she had two others that, they didn't get a mention as to who they are, should have had some sort of mention, I would have thought. Uh, well, I mean, the there's been that, like fan rumour for ages that Sabine from Rebels was going to be in it and a lot of people thought, oh, maybe that's Sabine. Uh, once they heard that, I think Saoirse Banks was going to be the actress, I think it is, and uh, that didn't work. So apparently uh, the character's called, the female character's called Koska Reeves and I don't know who the guy is, so it's definitely not Sabine yeah. for those people out there. Uh, but yeah, go on. And it's interesting to see that when he said, you know, you've taken off your helmet and they talk about it, she says, well, you're part of the cult. You know, you were the child of the what it seems like to be the cult. And it, it, that yeah. makes more sense now. You know, you sort of see that, you know, factions of, of Mandalorians have done what they've done and that actually makes far more sense. Maybe uh, in future episodes, he may relax that a little bit and you may see him take his helmet off. So this is an interesting sort of conundrum for the show because... Um... <clears throat> The whole Mandalorian backstory was covered extensively in the Clone Wars and a little bit in Rebels. Um, but the whole thing about the Death Watch and who they were and Bo-Katan, and she was originally a part of Death Watch originally uh, and then sort of sh shifted over to uh, different allegiances. And Mandalorian culture has always been about various cults and various groups and who's in power and whatever. And the idea of the Death Watch is that they wanted to take over Mandalore, which had become a bit more sort of political and a bit... Um, pacifist if you will uh, and make it a bit more of a warrior culture which has had been originally and there's a lot of backstory that goes on regarding that and you know for fans who know this stuff it's like it's absolutely awesome to see it in live action but for people who have no idea what's going on who've never watched the animated series any of them whatsoever and there's a lot of fans who have never done that uh it's be like well we're kind of not getting it i'm not we're just not sure what's happening here uh so what this means and i think it was confirmed originally in the first season of the show that din was rescued by the death watch uh mm -hmm. and of course they had the whole thing of leave the helmet on and whatever else and clearly he, he was probably meant to become a soldier of the future in support of death watch the idea it's, it's a bit like the um, like the first order start them off as children indoctrinate them the way you want them to be and of course they don't change that way and of course his character is a lot like that so you are right. Maybe at some point he will realise that there's um, he's been following the wrong allegiances and he will take the helmet off and that'll be like the big, oh, my God, he's like he's, he's changed. He's become a normal guy. So, um, you know, which I think is probably going to be a very defining moment. Maybe the end of the season or something, they'll do that. And suddenly, Din, you know, Pedro gets to sort of show his face on a regular basis and maybe they'll do that. <clears throat> yeah, it was interesting to see that um, Moff Gideon turns up in hologram form. Yeah. Uh, because you go, well, hang on a second, you know, he's obviously in control of that sector uh, and, and the, the Empire is still around sort of thing. But the fact that the Darksaber was mentioned, you know, and you sort of, you made those two connections um, with Bo-Katan and, and that, and you go, well, you know, like you said, for those who watched the, the other series, it's like, oh, now we've got some interesting history we've got to figure out and yeah. see what's actually possible or plausible as to what's actually happened between the two and why she lost it in the first place. But that then sort of like brings into the whole thing of the Imperial Empire. And I was really surprised that, one, it was the Imperials who were like getting all the gun shipments and putting them in the ship and flying away. And then there's a reference to a fleet as well. And uh, so what did you think of all that? Because there's actually, I did a bit more research on what was going on. So, but what did you think of all that? I thought it was interesting. Why, you know, you've got this, this the Empire's got a ship on a planet in the middle of nowhere. It's full of weapons. It's got a squadron, which I don't know how many a squadron is in terms of stormtroopers, but there seem to be a ton of them. Then you get inside and you're fighting them all off. And like, seriously, they should have been outnumbered, outgunned, and, and at least someone should have lost 
an arm, a leg, a bladder control, something mm. like that. You know, you got four Mandalorians against a whole platoon of stormtroopers. Yeah. I love the scene where there's the four of them and they've got all this gunfire coming straight at them. And it's like, we can't get past them. And we, we're dropping now, you know, 10,000, 9,000. Like, seriously, there's four Mandalorians. You could sacrifice one of them and, you know, one would run similar to what, what mm. um, Din did. And then he throws the, the two bombs in there. You know, you got rocket launchers and fired this and blah, blah, blah. And you got rockets on your back. You could have just launched that in there as well. And it's like, come on, guys, you, you're, you're not thinking of how to actually knock out an entire squadron, I didn't think. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good point. They could have potentially lost a dude. When Din ran down the corridor and I thought, oh, he's getting hit. Oh, here we go. Our hero's copping a bit of a whacking. I was like, he's going to come up and he's going to have blood pissing out of here and he's going to lose an arm or whatever. He's going to be completely busted up. And he just stands up. He's like, not a mark on him. <laughs> it's not, like nothing. It's like, pink, I'm, I'm done. And uh, I thought, oh, yeah, 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 my work here is is, is, is complete. So uh, you are right. I thought that was probably a little too easy. But so it actually leads into the point of like, okay, what's the deal with the Imperials now? I've got a bit of a, had a bit of an issue about this for a while. It's like, hang on, there seems to be Imperials everywhere. Like the Empire is gone, has been gone for at least four years by this point after the Imperial Concordance was signed a year after Return of the Jedi. So, and they seem to be popping up everywhere. And of course, when I heard the reference to fleets and things, I go, hang on, they, they, they seem to be a bit more organized than what we first thought. And so I had to do a bit of research. And for that, this is a little bit hardcore, a bit dirty, but it would turn out, it was actually mentioned in a comic of all things, that prior to the Empire collapsing, Palpatine had sent a message out to certain uh, high ranking commanders saying, in the event that he carked it, right? the Imperial Empire was to nick off to the unknown regions and rebuild, which is where the First Order comes from. But all the dregs, all the losers of the Empire didn't get that message. So in other words, they took the best of the best out to the outer regions, the unknown regions, and left the leftovers. And these guys are effectively the leftovers, with the exception probably of Moff Gideon. It doesn't make sense as to why he didn't get picked because he clearly is pretty switched on. So it would it, the logic is, make of this what you will, that the stormtroopers and the imperial officers and all the rest of it aren't the cream of the crop, right? And which probably explains why in the first order they're so fanatical. So maybe there's a bit of a, a logical understanding of this to start with, because when you look in this show of the imperial officer, the guy in the in the cockpit and the two cockpit guys, and you go, the uniforms aren't fitting correctly, and they're like a bit of a bunch of idiots, really, when it comes down to it. And maybe that's got something to do with it. And of course, the imperial remnant, what's been left, is they're all scattered everywhere. So there's bits of them all over the place. And maybe that's got uh, something to do with it. Hence the reason why in the previous episode, the New Republic said that they were actually looking for Imperial sympathisers who are still floating around the place. And this is also covered off, I believe, in the Aftermath novel. So that may explain why we're getting all these Imperial guys creeping around when there really shouldn't be. And I thought, oh, okay, I may have to readjust my thinking on that one. So uh, what do you reckon? If, if, you're, if you're suggesting that all the, the top rankings, and I would say that Moff Gideon got that memo as well, would Maybe. it not be a smart thing if, if everyone's been sent out to the outer rim, someone's got to stay back. Now, if you're really ruthless and Moff Gideon seems to be the ruthless sort of, and the smart sort of guy that he is, if he knows that everyone else has taken off, you can then control the entire yeah. Yeah. inner sec section of that. Basically say, look, you know, I'm the next in charge and you're all going to follow me. That makes perfect sense for him to stay inside of it. So the first order can can be created, and all whoever else wants to be created. But he sort of sits there and goes, "Well, this whole thing's for the yeah. taking. I'll I'll just take over and and run it how I want." Which makes a great deal of sense, and I think that makes uh, that works because in the Star Wars universe, once everybody nicked off to the unknown regions, by and large, the New Republic forgot all about them until they came back as the first order so that makes a lot of sense so you're right i think maybe he did get the memo he goes yeah yeah i'll just stay put well, everybody else nicks off and all the people who were above him maybe all the people he was competing against they've all buggered off and he goes beauty look at this i've got all these ships i've got all these forces i've got all these dudes and they've got no leadership whatsoever so i'm just going to come in i've got my dark saber i've got that from somewhere and that's it i'm the king of the castle and of course that leads into the story about why the, uh, the the guys are fanatical. It's like, oh, you know, you, you know what to do if the ship's been taken over, crash the ship and destroy it and kill yourself. And I thought, hang on, that was interesting because in the Imperial Empire, they've never been that fanatical, really. Uh, in the First Order, they are, but not not in the in the Empire. And it's like, it's sort of skirting a sort of a new way of thinking. You know, long live the Empire, smash the ship and kill yourself and all this sort of business. So yeah, that's sort of heading down some interesting paths that we haven't really sort of seen before. So yeah, interesting developments. Yeah, well, we seem to have this series that's now a bit more grown up in a lot of areas. Maybe that's the case. And maybe this is where 
Uh, they might build a small bridge between the timelines from Mandalorian to uh, the Force Awakens sort of thing. And maybe that's sort of we'll see something, depending on how long the Mandalorian goes mm. for. If it goes for five, six, seven seasons, that might continue to build that bridge there. But it seems to sort of be putting some seeds in place to to create that uh, yeah. those thoughts. And, you know, you're right, maybe that's the case. Uh, but the thing is, I thought it was funny. He gets told to crash the ship. And I thought, OK, all the stormtroopers on board are dead. How would they all feel? It's like, hang on, why are we going down instead of up? So I was like, what's going on here? So maybe they would help the Mandalorians to break into the cockpit to you know save the day. So, And I did like the fact that in the distance, you saw the ship crash and the three heroes uh, fly away. That was, them. again, brilliant, brilliant <clears throat> imagery. It was just absolutely stunning to watch. And it was was done very very nicely um so they made a reference of course to ahsoka now we knew ahsoka was going to be in the show because uh that was like mentioned before the the season even started that she was going to be a live action uh, character that's all very very cool uh and i can't remember the actress who's playing her but uh uh it was very funny they said you'll find ahsoka on kaladin uh, and I thought, hey, Kaladin's from June. It's like, it's like they couldn't even think of an original name. They just changed one letter since Keta Kalatan. It's Kalodan. And it's like, oh, it's still the same place. So I thought that was kind of funny. And of course, it was interesting. They're saying, Bo Katan says, oh, yeah, Ahsoka's a Jedi. Well, actually, Ahsoka's not a Jedi. <laughs> she's actually, she's a, a past Jedi, a force sensitive person, but she never rejoined the Jedi Order after she left it, you know, in the Clone Wars. So, you know, playing with technicalities, you know, it is what it is, who cares? But, you know, if you want to split hairs, you, she could, uh, it, like Din could say, here's the kid, and, you know, you're a Jedi, take the kid, and she goes, yeah, I've got some bad news for your son, I'm not actually a Jedi, so I've got white lightsabers and everything. <laughs> it's like, he's staying with you. So uh, there was some really, really good stuff that happened in the show, especially with the kid. I mean, the kid always, once he's got screen time, is absolutely fantastic. I love it when he's eating his dinner in the bar, and it's like a real face hugger moment, <laughs> straight in. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then and then the man that says stop playing with your food and yeah. the kid's like get it off get it off <laughs> having a hard day at the office hey? kids now starting to speak too getting a couple of words out there you know so uh yeah that's that's actually kind of cool and sounds a lot more like a baby actually so a modern day yeah. human baby so and the fact that it, there's one thing that i i sort of had a bit of a look who's talking moment it's it's the mando holding the kid and and the frog's walking off with the, the eggs and the kid looks at him and he goes, I know what you're thinking, uh, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah, we'll get your food soon. He goes, mm, and his yeah. ears fold in. And goes, oh, very cute. There was there one thing when the the squid face guys, for those who don't know who they are, uh, and right. I know you just mentioned them and I can't remember what they're called. Quarren. You know, and all, yeah, those guys, when they all sort of rock up and, and he's gotten off the, the, the ship and he's got the kid in his hand and he goes, you killed my brother. And he's like, oh, not you killed my brother. That whole episode of... <laughs> Here we go. It's like the dirty dozen. It's like every other, you know, yeah, like Princess every Bride sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man <laughs> film. Yeah, you kill my brother. Get my revenge. Sort Prepare of thing. to die. <laughs> Prepare to exactly die. right. And then all of a sudden he goes, "Yeah, all right." There's and he's. You can see in his head he's going, "Okay, there's one there. There's six here." And you yeah. know, how am I going to do this? Um, and then the Mandos rock up and fire fight. The see, clearly. The Quarren needed to watch previous episodes of The Mandalorian, and they would have learned that ganging up on Din never works. He just brings out his whistling Dixies, and he just, they're all dead. And he's just thinking, oh, not again. So, yeah, that was a little predictable, but, you know, yeah, I agree with you. It's like, oh, you killed my brother. It's like, oh, yeah, whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's very, very good. Um, and finally, I did like the bit that when the uh, Razor Crest went into hyperspace, a little bit fell off the back at the end. That was that was really, yeah. really cute. And it's all hooked up with fishing, fishing wires, and it's like yeah. a trawler on the inside, yeah. and there's... It's like, oh, that's not going to end well for him. Yeah, exactly right. So there you go. Um, any further thoughts, final thoughts on the old uh, Mandalorian episode, uh, The Heiress, before we give it some ratings? What do you reckon, MBS? <clears throat> uh, yeah, one other thing which sort of came to mind was when the kid gets pushed into the, on the when they're on the boat, he gets pushed in and, and that creature's coming up. The creature must have thought, oh, man, it's like a metal kinder surprise, you know? <laughs> Metal on the outside, squishy bit on the inside, but unfortunately you <laughs> couldn't break through it. So I thought that was kind of funny. Opens it up and goes. <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, I I thought it was a fairly good episode, and for that I'm going to give it. Oh, I was thinking three and a half. I think I'm going to give it four, four, whatever it is that we give them. Four helmets. Mm. That's what it is. Four helmets, four mate. Helmets. Four helmets. Four helmets. Very good. Well done. Um, I looked at it and I thought, 
Um, it was really good for serious Star Wars fans who know all the history and, you know, we've been watching the animated series and the Rebels and Clone Wars and whatever and seeing Bo-Katan and all the sort of stuff in, in real life uh, was really good, okay? So it was a real button pusher for a lot of fans. Uh, but I still have an issue that if you're a casual viewer who has never watched any of that stuff, you're going to be lost and you do have to wonder how the audience is going to sort of deal with that. So you'll have one half who goes, oh, it's the greatest thing in the universe and the other half going, um, yeah, whatever. So uh, give me more of the kid. At least the kid, I can relate to the kid. Um, but uh, I have to look at it from the point of view for myself personally because I do know that history and that backstory, even though it's very convoluted and it's a lot to take in. I've got to say, it's just like it's a real head spin, some of this Mandalorian stuff. Um, I've given, I've given it four and a half stars based on that uh, because uh, it was just good to sort of see that in action. And now that I know a bit more about the Imperial Remnant, Thing that's going on with that because I was critical about that originally and what happened with Corrin and the, what the look and feel of the show. Uh, yeah, I thought it was um, definitely one of the best, uh, which is why I thought that, yeah, you didn't need last week's episode. You could have yeah. just by- bypassed that altogether, just flown straight from Tatooine to Trask and away we go. So, uh, yeah, that's what I thought. And um, be very curious to see where they go from here. I mean, they only have like, was it five episodes left? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, and of course, Ahsoka is going to be popping up at some point, and that'll be one that the fans are going to be absolutely hanging out for. Be very, very interesting to see what they do with that. And you would think logically that'll that'll be potentially at the end of the season when they decide what they're going to do with the kid. So, uh, but yeah, it's still you have that issue of like characters popping up for one episode only and then disappearing. So, mm-hmm. with a bit of luck, we'll see Bo Katan again, and uh, maybe she'll even meet Moff Gideon in the flesh as well. That'd be uh, something worth seeing. So, we'll have to keep our yeah. eyes open for that. I think that. Go. I th- think they need to push out and not be like a, a, a week in the you know a day in the week sort of thing of, of the Mandalorian because there's so much more to tell and if they're doing 36 or 24 episodes in a season yeah that's fine you can you can throw out you know those fluffy episodes but eight episodes you want to be succinct with your storytelling and I don't think it's it's quite there yet you know maybe good things come in small packages like the child (laughs) so uh, you never know you're lucky in the big city there you go but hey we'll find all that out next week so uh just like uh the mandalorian we too shall be back picking bits apart it's very exciting stuff so in the interim make sure you keep on warsing on because i don't know what else to say and uh we'll catch you then so uh bye for now okay remember this is the way bye yeah